I'm at the Cinema Nova in Carlton to see Julian Assange's dad in a Q&A. His name's John Shipton. And uh, it'll be after the screening of a, a movie about David McBride, who's a uh, government whistleblower, uh, a military, uh, military crimes whistleblower. Uh, and this is a part of a, uh, a part of events to support uh, Julian Assange and get him set free because he was exposing government crimes. So I'll ask uh, people a few questions and get some footage of the night and uh, hopefully it makes a good video. Hi, I'm David McBride and I'm proud to introduce this film you're about to see, Declassified. In September, I will be facing court charged with leaking government secrets as a whistleblower. If convicted, I face a lifetime imprisonment. This film was produced independently by Trees and Flowers in an attempt to tell my side of the story and to show you my journey for the past couple of years. I hope you enjoy it and I hope it inspires other people to stand up against injustice. And they bandy around words like fighting for democracy, defending democracy, all these slogans, especially when we're going to war. And it makes me start to question, and perhaps some of our speakers tonight will be able to answer a little bit of this, what our governments are actually fighting for when we're seeing increasingly more redactions in freedom of information, and we're seeing whistleblowers, journalists, and lawyers being brought before the courts for exposing war crimes. So on that jolly note, I would like to introduce our three wonderful speakers for tonight. First of all, we've got Mr. Greg Barnes. He is a barrister and he's been working for a long time on the Australian Assange campaign um, and he works in criminal law and human rights. Please welcome Mr. Greg Barnes. Uh, we of course had the scandalous raids uh, a number of years ago uh, in which we saw the side of the AFP entering uh, private residences and the offices of a number of media organisations in Australia. And it could happen again, because we have allowed both the Labor Party and the Coalition to pass laws in this country with very little opposition, except for the principal opposition of the Greens and, and occasionally others, which effectively say that if, for example, there is an ASIO special operation, and that is reported, uh, you can go to jail for five years uh, or ten years in aggravated cases. So as a country and as a nation, every time that you find something in government that you think is wrong uh, and that you think you've got a moral obligation to reveal, you take a risk that governments will seek you to close you down. And it's, it's, it's extremely evident in, in right to information or right not to have information, or freedom of not to have information laws. The number of documents that people get every day, journalists and ordinary citizens and lawyers, which are fully redacted, is just extraordinary. Fully redacted, as in the whole page is black. And don't think it's just the federal government that does it. It's governments, it's state and territory governments all around Australia. They are addicted to black ink. They are addicted to it. They are addicted to ensuring that they will not reveal information that you have to you have to then take them the onus then falls back on you to take them to the AAT or VCAT or the federal court or wherever you need to go and I've just finished doing a case for Stefania Marizzi an Italian journalist who sought information on Assange and that's what we came up against the last point I'll make is this Louise ever since 9-11 and particularly since 9-11 the rubric of national security has been thrown over domestic law in so many areas. And it's bullshit. I can assure you, having, having been a member of the defence team in a terrorism trial in Melbourne in 2008, the number of times in the lead up to that trial that Australian government lawyers would come in and say, you can't have access to that document because it's national security. And what happens is this, under the National Security and Information Act, and this will shock you because it's Kafka-esque. So what happens is, they come in and they say, we make an application to, to cloak this document with the National Security and Information Act 
provisions, which means that offence can't see it. But you can see it, Your Honour, in private, and then when you've read it, you can tell us whether you think we're right. And no doubt, and no doubt they pepper these affidavits, because I saw some of the public affidavits in that, in that uh, case when they opposed bail, and they were peppered with, you know, the usual, you know, there's a terrorist attack around the corner type rhetoric. And what happens is the magistrate or judge goes and reads it, comes back white face and says, oh, no, 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 you're right, you can't have it. Now, it's an appalling piece of legislation that's consistently abused. Um, but this is the sort of power that we have given to governments in the wake of the so-called war on terror. And, and then it is that, that practice has seeped into more broadly the public information space. Julian Assange's father, uh, who is facing 175, not his father, but Julian, is facing 175 years in a US jail, which is deemed some of the most barbaric in the world, um, for exposing US war crimes, uh, which is an effective death sentence, which Greg will be able to tell you about in legal terms. So his father, the subject of that film, is also here, Mr John Shipton. If the government stands behind us, as in the case of David or Julian, if the government stands behind us, we take arms to support the government as a consequence that spreads throughout the community and the cohesion of the community and its aggregate intelligence grows. What do I mean by aggregate intelligence? The intensity of cooperation between governance and the people are a measure of intelligence. As a credibility gap grows, there's a decline in intelligence and you have most extraordinary things during COVID of policemen arresting an eighth month pregnant lady for writing something in Facebook. And that becomes the, that becomes the only way that government can govern is through arbitrary declaration. And through demonstration of that arbitrary declaration, through the arrest of, well, a prestigious solicitor who's worked in and out of government, or with his life, Bernard Collery, a soldier, a major, a lawyer, who did uh, terms in Afghanistan and has an impeccable pedigree. And they hold him up. Or Julian Assange, who, for some reason or other, can only speak and utter truthfulness. And so they hold him up and turn him ragged after a 13-year persecution full of malice and malevolence at the government level. What to say? Who amongst us would not tremble with indignation faced with what Julian, the malice, the daily malice? Julian is kept incommunicado. That's really the sum of it. He can, he had 18 months now since he's been able to attend one of his own court cases. He's refused permission. That's the sum of it. Malice. And that is what has been done to Julian. So our, our how is it going? Our support has enabled Julian to withstand this deluge. And each day he rings me if you like if I'm not in the shower or something, you know, I don't hear the phone or and I report back and I you know, today I reported back that we were meeting David McBride and we we're meeting Greg Barnes and, and so on. And this is heartening that because they're in a little box this big, they can't see out. So that there's a world outside that's swirling around, conveying, you know, John Donne, is it John Donne? 
sent an astronaut for who the bell tolls and tolls for me. So there is within us a means of conveying and giving strength to each other. And in the case of Julian Assange, I give you thanks for your time. And last, but of course not least, the man who you have been watching this evening, the subject of this film. Uh, he is about to face the courts. Uh, I think it's not... I, I try and be uh, unbiased in these things normally, but I think when you look up the definition of a hero, and I'm sure there's a lot for this, but that is pretty much the definition of heroism, when you sacrifice yourself for the greater good, uh, no matter the consequences to you personally. So please join us, Mr. David. <laughs> The more I looked into it, the more sinister it became. I could see uh, that it, the lies that the US told were incredible. One of the uh, interesting things from my point of view, it, the collateral murder video is quite well known. But from a military point of view, an insider's point of view, it's not so much the, the, the shooting dead of the civilians, bad as that is. Uh, what is really sinister about that is that the uh, Army Command doctored the video and they showed it to the Reuters and they said, it's all fine. Now, that is really bad. I mean, crazy soldiers is one thing, but once you get generals who are complicit in murders, and there are a lot of other cases too, and they are uh, covering up for crimes and going to the world's press, uh, with a straight face, saying nothing happened here, that's a real problem. And not only did they do that, but their government, when they got caught out, the government supported them, not WikiLeaks. Now, that is a criminal government. Uh, that's not a bad soldier, that's a criminal government. And it's a, it's a very... I didn't come to that conclusion uh, easily, but it's, uh, it's a fact. Uh, and that's one of the hard things about the case, and John Gregor's saying, it's hard and everyone here will know that. We don't want to be painted as a conspiracy theorist and you get written off. But the fact, the more you look into these cases, it is really very, very bad. There is, you know, the, the most uh, the most sinister, destructive element in the world today is the US government. Uh, there's no doubt about that. And um, uh, they're, they're not, no one's going to play fair on Julius Assange. I still think we're going to win. We're going to get him out. But we don't, don't expect um, it to suddenly uh, roll over. They know what they're doing. They've known what they're doing for a while. Uh, they have told lie after lie. They have operative after operative trying to set people up. And, uh, yeah, I don't want to scare you because I said I think we're going to win. But it's, it's a very big, a very big uh, dragon. Uh, and in some ways we are lucky to have these cases and that's why I'm lucky to go to trial because you can't, it won't be good enough as in Berners' case if they just drop the charges. We need to follow, because it'll just happen again in 10 years' time, 20 years, we need to follow this through to the end. Uh, we need it to blow up in their faces and that will happen. It's a bit like we would never have beaten the Nazis had they not invaded Russia. Where basically they were saying, uh, Spies from ACES can kill people, kill each other, rape and murder, you know, someone, violent. And the only people that would ever go to jail over that is someone that spoke about it. Yeah. And, they, and they said that with a straight face. Yeah. And that, you know, the op we have obviously lost our way yeah. as, a government, as a country. That is not the country I grew up in and want to fight for. And that is obviously wrong with the edges. And, and it shows you how pathetic they are. Um, and also tonight we have, as John was talking about just a moment ago, uh, this book, The Trial of Julian Assange by Nils Melzer. So he uh, is the former special rapporteur on torture for the UN and he's written a whole book about um, all of his discoveries in examining the case. It's quite a page turner. Um, so all of the proceeds from the sales of these books at the front will also go to David's defence uh, fundraiser. And it was banned from Parliament.
Ooh. It's a bad book. Everybody loves a bad now book. Now you really want it. Yeah. Ooh. All right, my darling. Um, last question to you. Well, uh, what I wanted to ask was maybe if you could summarise what we could actually do. Maybe give three points each of what we could actually practically do to help either your own personal situations or at a, at a larger scale. Uh, me first? Yeah. Yeah, okay. um, look, they've all got two telephone numbers and staff <laughs> demand them. Every single parliamentarian. Those that have supported Julie, ring them up and say thanks. Those that have happened, ring them up and say what do you think you're doing here? We uh, want this man brought back to Australia. Don't be rude, but you can be very firm. <laughs> I, I mean, I'd add to that. John, John's absolutely right. Um, your local member has an obligation to see you if you're a constituent and go in groups of three and four and demand a meeting. Your constituents, your local member, uh, and you're entitled to get a meeting, particularly in cases where, as John says, they've either said nothing about it or they've been hostile. Mostly these days, there are very few who are hostile. It's mainly they haven't done anything. But go and see them. Um, and um, if they won't give you a meeting and try and flop you off to the staff, say no, we're constituents and we represent a much larger number of people. Nothing beats it than, than knocking on the door of your local MP. Yeah, yeah that's good. Um, in, in, I do see it in everything in military terms. I do think we're going to win this. Don't get down hard about it. Don't complain. Um, and just see it in terms of how sweet it's going to be when you win. And call, yeah, call the MPs. They don't have a brain of their own. <laughs> if they get enough calls, <laughs> I'm going to say, except for our esteemed friends. <laughs> and the major part, if, you, if they get enough calls, they get enough calls about something, that will become their opinion. Uh, I, you know, they, that's how they go. And you write to the newspapers, tweet, 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 set up a couple of different accounts, just like they do, use all the enemy's techniques. Um, and, uh, you know, say how good I am and what a disgrace. Uh, just, you just go nuts. It's like we've come, we've landed in Normandy, we're going towards Berlin now, and uh, it's a race to get there and, and cover yourself in glory by the last, next couple of months, doing everything you possibly can to harass your local member. I'll, I'll add to that and just say you're armed now. You've had an amazing Q&A here with these gentlemen tonight. You're armed with a lot of knowledge. Talk about it, tell your friends, tweet about it, ring your MPs. Your governments can't do anything you don't let them do. So don't get aggressive and unpleasant with people, but tell them what's going on. Read about it. All right, so how's the uh, Assange campaign going? It's going very well. Uh, and we've got uh, real momentum. Uh, as you can see, many, many Australians uh, irrespective of their political views, are saying this case has to end. Uh, this is a journalist who uh, has served the world well and Australia well in revealing the war crimes of the United States. This is the sort of thing we ought to be knowing about and he ought not be facing jail of 170 odd years. Uh, and so from, uh, you know, th this could happen to any Australian journalist and that's the point. Uh, any Australian journalist who published something the United States didn't like could find themselves on the end of an extradition request. So all Australians need to stand up on this, and particularly the Australian media.